because I stopped, I forgot to record last week something. So that was made a real pain in the neck. And then I continued to try to record it on my other computer by myself. And I, oh, it was, I could not, it, I was actually trying to record the makeup class and it was very tough. And I couldn't get it, I couldn't get the disc to record to, oh, anyway, it was a nightmare. So I've given you a pattern envelope with a pattern inside because I want you to see what the whole package looks like. And I think that these period patterns are so beautiful. And I wanted to just show you that period patterns have been around a long time. And one of the things you can do is review the lecture on commercial patterns. Take a look at the front of this pattern envelope and you have a pattern envelope and I'll, sh and I'll share that when we get to that point. But bus 34, size 16. Now, that's why I say women's sizing is so difficult to work with because, you know, a size 16 is considered a, a larger size. Actually, the average women's size is a 14 and, a, and is the average woman's five foot four, which doesn't qualify for any of us. And, um, you know, a size 16 is what I've been most my whole life. Um, but bus 34, no way. I don't think I've been bus 34 since sixth grade, but the pattern sizing has gone through significant changing, just like commercial fashion sizing in department stores. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. And one of the things we'll talk about today is how to measure a pattern piece so that you can make it fit you. And then just another stunning uh, picture. This is, this is from the 50s, okay? I'm looking at this one to see when this is. Probably 50s because neither one of these has, this sweetheart neckline is a very, this way that it dips in the center is very 50s. It is not a 40s, it has no shoulder pads. So you can see this is the same time period. Although the patterns did not change sizing until 1968 when they did something called new sizing. And that was when we got a brand new sizing matrix. So that's number one, review your commercial pattern lecture from today because there will be questions from it on your final. Turn in your fabric resource notebook. Um, this is a piece of raw silk. I thought it was quite interesting because you could easily see the over under plain weave. And also because people think of raw silk or, uh, or silk in general as something that's very filmy, lightweight and flowing, but this also can be, silk can also actually look and mask like wool. Then we're going to look at our pattern layout for the COVID mask, which is based on this paper mask. You're gonna cut it. And this is, a, this is a pleated edge of a mask. You can see one pleat, two pleat right here, a mask. And then this is a tie that goes around the head. I thought that we're gonna begin the construction by cutting it out and the fighting the, the, Rovi, the Rosie the Riveter mask taking on the mask, I thought was, was really apt. I hadn't seen her before. And then washing your masks. So they, because they, these happen to have the ear piece, I prefer the uh, kind that ties around the head because I put it up on my ear and then I can control it. Otherwise my ears go like this and they hurt. I don't like that feeling and it hurts, uh, especially one side. So even if I make it looser, but um, these are air dry. Technically, it is better to wash and then machine dry. Heat is one of the things that kills COVID. So those are basically what we're going to do this week. We'll be working on the mask. You'll be turning in your fabric ID resource notebook. Those are our two primary um, things. And then uh, let's look at going forward. I don't think it's next. Uh, maybe I can just do next. I might as well, because it's for the week. So this is our patterning, cutting, and construction of the face mask. Here's a video of making the face mask, the New York Times article that we went over last time, and how to make a face mask. That is, it's a 100-point project. It's really your final project for the class. 
This is also how to make a mask by hand. And I made my mask by hand. And if you want to do that, this is from April 22nd this year. And then hand pleating, I did a great, um, I, I shouldn't say I did a great lecture, but there's a lecture on pleating and what pleating is, what pleating does for us. And it's a, as just a style thing, not just a mask thing. And then looking forward to next week, I want you to read chapter seven. We're gonna talk about fa fabric modification and dyeing, and I'll do a dyeing demonstration for you. And these are some uh, dye powders, which is a very cool picture. Your completed crew handbook is due next week on Wednesday. So I thought appropriate, we see a crew person, we see people in costume, we see backstage, and that's for next week. We're, we're really uh, wrapping it up. Um, for this semester. So that would be our whole weekly module. Let me go to week, uh, here we are. So here's our whole week. And we will start with our pattern book. So please take a moment and get out of your um, supply bag that I sent you the pattern envelope handout, and I will share with you. I'm gonna pause the recording and get mine so I can set it up on, where am I? Here we go. So that I can set it up with the board. So first we're gonna work with our pattern envelope handout. And the reason why I've done this organization is so that you can actually see what a pattern envelope looks like, although we looked at a close up of one and you have one in your hand. Let's talk about what are the things that you see on the front of this pattern envelope? What are some of the things you see? Tara, what do you see? Um, I see a size and a number. Right. Okay, yeah, size, number, 4090 is the number. Right, and so here, size 16. And then notice the bust is not on the front of this anymore. So we, we, would, we have to go to the back side, which is this. This would be shaped like this. And now you're looking at just the front of what a pattern envelope would look like and about the right size, okay? So I just wanna make sure everyone can see it. What's the biggest thing you see, Spenson? Biggest thing? Mm -hmm. Well, except the title, yeah. I saw the models. This, okay. This is the name of the pattern company. Butterick is the name of the pattern company. There are multiple pattern companies. So Butterick is one of them. They actually have a, quite a good reputation. There's Vogue from Vogue magazine has a pattern. Company, um, Simplicity, McCall's, Berta, there's all, all any number of different pattern companies and you they indicate the style by this number. So if you were gonna not buy it online or you're going to buy it online or in a fabric store, you indicate the pattern name, the company and the number, and then you indicate the size that you want. Okay, so we'll talk about what size in just a moment. This is uh, Beverly Fabric had a no return. And this is a 70s pattern that's handwritten on by myself based on the styling. Now we get to what you were talking about, Smenson, the style, right? You mm -hmm. see the figures. There are four figures and this is a pattern for a skirt only. Does not include a bodice but you can't really tell that from this particular viewpoint. It could, it, you might assume that it is all of those items, but how can you tell the styling apart? They're indicated by a small style letter, okay? So if we look at skirt A, we are looking at this long, skirt with a ruffle on the bottom. And interestingly, this 
skirt with the ruffle on the bottom also is like a 19th century period petticoat, except that it's cut on the bias, but this general silhouette is often like that. B is a short version, C is a midi, and D is long with contrasting trim. Okay, do you see that? So keep that in mind as we look at the back of the pattern envelope. And this is where you really need your specs if you've got the tiny um, numbers up here. And you can see that they are indicated by skirt A, skirt B, skirt C, and skirt D. Okay, across the top, we have sizing. So let's take a look at what it doesn't include. On the very beginning, it says, I wrote that in pattern envelope, but it says Mrs. Skirt, and that's it. So we know that the only thing that's in this envelope is a skirt. Nowadays, I'm trying to see if they would say it, but it's, it's a newer thing. Now they would say skirt, uh, blouse not included. And then at the bottom, you can see the variations in a line drawing without shading of the skirt silhouette, front and back. So that should you have any questions, this really does help clarify exactly what you're looking at from the front. And you can see how it's less confusing than seeing something that has a pattern indicated where you may not be able to see the style lines and you can't really see what's happening at the bottom of the skirt. So this is the line drawing can be very beneficial because you will reference this when we look at the fabrics that are required. So reading across the top, what does the first thing say, Cara? Can you, re can you check that out right here? Uh, weight, waist. Waist. And Waist, hip, hip, size. And size, exactly. So this is size 16. And here we have, I'm just bringing this up because we just looked at size 16. This is hip 40. And the ones, the size 16 we just looked at on the overview was hip 37. So the new sizing changed, you know, at least plus three inches to the hip. And now 40 hip is really a size eight. So, you know, it's, um, it's considered a rather smaller hip. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon that the human body has changed so drastically in the last 50 years. So this gives us measurements for each size and you would select where you are based on these measurements. So waist 30 and hip 40 gives you a 16. Now we will, I will show you how to alter it so that it will be the size that you need, but those are the sizes that are given uh, by the pattern company, okay? And the reason why the sizing is important is because when you purchase fabric, larger sizes may require more fabric. So if we look at skirt A, which is the long skirt with the ruffle, and it says the very first indicator is 44.45, that is the width of the fabric. That's the width of the fabric showing from salvage to salvage or how the fabric was loomed, okay? The one below that is 60. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna stop sharing that for a moment so that I can gesture this way. So as it is, if it was 45 inches for the size six, you'd need five, five and three eighths yards. And then for the size 16, you'd need six yards. So you'd need more yardage because of the sizing. And then for skirt A size 60, 60 inch width, you need three and an eighth yards. So you, could, you need significantly less yardage if you have wider fabric, right? That's more than two yards less. And then if we go over to the size 16, we need, again, two and a quarter yards less. So I wanted to just talk about how do you read the pattern envelope? This is the traditional inches 
size and in the darker is centimeters for European sizing. So you may not be able to read that um, in your copy so well, but just know that in an actual pattern, they are giving you centimeters, should that be the way that you generally operate. So for here, we would pick out which view that you use and then you can figure out fabrics. So for D, which is a contrasting fabric, right? We'll turn that over. This is D right here. There's three different fabric choices there. So for D, it's gonna be a much longer pattern and it will say contrast front and back of 45 or 60, contrast side front and back, contrast three and contrast waistband and the band at the bottom. So there's actually four fabrics that are used for D. So it sounds a bit confusing, but we're gonna go through how this actually is really straightforward if that's the thing you wanna make. I learned to sew from a commercial pattern. This also requires interfacing and we know we used interfacing for our buttonhole. So expect something like interfacing probably for the waistband. And then you can use fusible, woven, non-woven. So some interfacing is not, doesn't glue on by ironing. Some interfacing just stitches in and that actually has more mobility and is more like the fabric so that it treats the inside of the fabric and the outside of the fabric the same. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other things that are on the pattern. So obvious diagonals are not suitable. It's giving you some ideas for what is appropriate. One-way design using a nap fabric and layout. So napped fabric, remember when we did our fabric identification was something like corduroy or velvet, it has a direction. So it has a pile to it and it has a direction of either down or up and it would not be suitable because this skirt has a bias feel to it. So it'd be very too varied. And then it says with nap, there's asterisk with nap, double asterisk without nap. And then that's referring to the yardage up above. So when you see an asterisk, you come down here and look at what does the asterisk mean. And then we have the width. This is sometimes very important for us on stage, the width at the lower end of the skirt. Now this can become very important for us if we are wearing, if it was say 10 women wearing these large skirts, we suddenly need more space on stage for women to move back and forth. Or if they have a petticoat underneath, they need a larger doorway or how much room does it, does it take for someone to pass someone else? And this is when rehearsal garments become extremely important. Actors are not familiar with wearing these kinds of clothing and they need to be hyper aware of being able to come up against someone. So, you know, in the age of social distancing, these skirts would be perfect. <laughs> so then we get down to the bottom where it says fabrics. What are, gives you some ideas for what fabrics might be appropriate to use for this skirt and notions. So fabrics, it says softer, crisp fabrics, broadcloth, calico, we did get a sample of calico, that was the printed muslin, chambray gauze, that's super lightweight, lightweight denim, we had denim, but not necessarily a lightweight denim, but you can imagine if this was made of a denim skirt, all denim, and you put that big ruffle on the bottom, you'd be carrying around several pounds of fabric. And then um, notions are additional things other than fabric that you need to successfully complete your pattern. And this says a seven inch skirt zipper, one hook and eye closure, um, seam binding for B. I wonder why B needs seam binding. Maybe they put it on the bottom of the skirt right here or the hem. Okay, questions about the front or back of the pattern. A Lot of information there, don't you think? A lot of information. I have to laugh because on the back of mine for notions, it just says thread. <laughs> On your, but not on this piece. You it's, have a yeah. of this, right? Oh yeah, no, not on that one. I'm looking on my actual. Yeah. Um, no, everybody got a pattern. Let me see what yeah. this bag has in it. This I just thought it was funny, like thread in case you'd forget that. You, oh, are you kidding? 
I've gotten home without matching thread. <laughs> so here's my pattern. And on the back, here's my envelope back. And what does it say for notions? Thread. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good one. Yep. That's funny. So inside, and this is also why you have your pattern, is I have given you the pattern instructions. So there's general instructions. Interestingly, the first page is the cutting instructions. So they show you, here's a line drawing of my pattern envelope. And then they give you instructions of how to lay the pattern out on the fabric and where your salvage is, and then where your uh, waistband would go, and the straight of the grain. Note the arrow indicates the lengthwise grain. So the lengthwise grain is going this way, and you can see that a lot of this, like here's the bias, here's the straight of grain, and then the straight of grain goes down the center front. So it's interesting that they give you the layout first and then they give you the interfacing. And then on the next page, they give you the general instructions. This is where I learned to sew. Because if you, it's, it is not, maybe not super intuitive, but if you can follow the general instructions and the symbols, then you will actually be very successful in making a garment. They tell you what every single thing means. What does a double notch mean, single notch? How do you lengthen and shorten? I'm gonna demo this all, I, I will demo all these things. But again, straight of the grain, fold line is this, is this little symbol. This is my cutting line, right? Each one of these things shows me what it is. It even tells you when it's showing you the backside or for example, on this piece, Here's the right side of the fabric in the white. And then here's the wrong side of the fabric. So you have to flip this over. That's why this would not be suitable for a nap because now we're going the opposite direction. So some of these things that we have is um, how to lengthen and shorten. Boy, that was always, that was a really big thing for me because I'm very tall. So my mom thought that, you know, Oh, you just add, I'm six inches taller than most humans, right? So just add six inches down here. Well, that meant that the wrist ended up here on my forearm and my forearm is bigger around than my wrist. Doesn't work very well that way. So then when I try to bend my elbow, the elbow part for bending is up here and I can't bend my elbow. It was, it was a revelation to go to the home at class and realized that I could adjust the pattern to my measurements and then have it fit me. My sister, I have three sisters. I'm one of six kids. There's a lot of us, but my sister that is immediately younger than I am is five, six, 121. She could cut a pattern out, sew it exactly like the pattern and put it on and it fit her perfectly. I wanted to that was not at all my experience. So this was really handy information for me. And it was almost as if she knew how to sew automatically. So, you know, this, this gives you special cutting information. If there's a star, open the fabric right side up and cut one of these. With right sides together, fold the fabric crosswise. That means that you're folding salvage to salvage this way and instead of lengthwise and I'll demo that as well. Transfer the markings. This means before removing the pattern from the fabric you want to transfer your construction lines and symbols and there's a circle a dot and we're going to talk about what transfer how you do that. You can transfer with tracing wheel and tracing paper chalk tailor's tax which is a stitching one. We do that if we feel like we have to sew something. And then, um, then you take your paper pattern off. And then under sewing instructions, we have these very handy information. Again, we're used to this 5 8 inch seam allowance given on all patterns unless otherwise indicated. Construct the garment following the sewing instructions, which we're gonna go through. 
pin seams, matching notches with corresponding numbers and matching symbols based with pins or thread. So if you pin it in place, sometimes that's about as good as, as basting with thread. But when we get to the zipper, we would definitely do basting with, machine, with thread. Stitch seams in direction of the fabric grain to prevent stretching, generally from the widest part to the narrowest part of each piece. Press as you sew. So all of these things we've been practicing, press as you sew. This thing of widest to narrowest is really an essential and a really good tip to making a good garment. And then press seams open unless indicated, clipping when necessary, we understand clipping. Trim enclosed seam into layers, we call this grading. Trim the corners, clip the inner corners and notch, meaning remove fabric for the outer curves. And then here's your symbol, the right side, the wrong side, the interfacing and the lining. And that's standard for all, most all patterns. And then we get to the quick sewing instructions. The first thing, one thing that you should know is that the way that a pattern works, then you could put it together by the numbers. And when I get, work, get my pattern out, you'll see what I mean. So first step one, you're gonna stitch front and back together. Look, you suddenly feel like you have a skirt already. Turn in a half an inch to the back opening and press. Turn in front opening edge along seam line. And that's because they're going to teach you how to put in a zipper for that back end. Stay stitch entire upper layer of skirt here around the waist so that it doesn't, so that it will not stretch out because it's a curve and there's a lot of weight there. So we'll talk about that. Machine based your interfacing and this is just like we did our interfacing for our buttonhole. This in fact looks like a sideways version of that. This is for the waistband. And they're having you do a hand stitch across the top so it's not seen, but you can machine base down here because that will be inside the waistband. And then uh, turn in the seam allowance on the long and notch side. That's because it's gonna fit here. Pin it on, put your waistband on, turn it over, top stitch right here. There's your extension. And so your hook and eye. Easy for you to say, right? And then look, it talks about stitching a ruffle on. Narrow the narrow hem the lower edge, which we did by using our fold and fold technique. And then uh, it says to narrow hem, turn along inside edge, turning one quarter inch to raw edge and stitch close to inner edge. Then gather to gather, stitch along the lines indicated using long machine stitches and they're telling you to do two long machine uh, stitches so that we can gather. And then you gather that into the waistband and then you turn your hem up, okay? So I just wanna show you this because now I'll show you how to do a layout. Any questions? That was a rather quick, rather quickly done, but you can review that. And it just gives you an introduction to the pattern envelope. Ideas, questions? Okay, one thing that I do when I'm gonna work with a pattern is I turn my iron on because you're getting something that's folded in a very small envelope. Look at this. Here's my pattern. Your pattern looks similar. Here's my instruction sheet. My mom used to just tape this to the to the wall in front of the iron in front of the uh, right in front of the sewing machine. So this would be up on the wall so that it could easily be seen, and then we could go from one step to step four the hem. Okay, but look at these tiny pieces, or sometimes they're giant pieces fold it up in some random way because a machine folds them up. So that's why I say, get out your iron, okay? And that way you can make these into a flat, manageable piece. So I'm gonna turn the iron on. Okay. 
this is one instance when you want no steam. When you're working with this tissue paper, steam or moisture will destroy the paper, okay? Just like any tissue paper. And then after you use it, after you use the pattern, it's easiest if you actually fold it along those seam lines or to try and actually get it to fit back into the envelope. The other thing you can do is create a paper envelope, put the pattern on the front and have a larger space to hold your pattern. So I'm going to show you how to lay out a pattern. Let me get my piece ready and I'll lower this. Oh, let's see. There, we can see the table pretty well. So I have a pattern that I'm working with and I'm gonna also demo uh, putting it up against uh, on a mannequin as well. Okay, actually, I am really wondering where my pattern went. Okay, I guess I'll work with this one. So this pattern needs quite a bit of material. I'm gonna pull this out. And this is in two pieces. It's more than that, but here's the skirt, and I'm going to work just with the bodice. So that's the bodice is the top portion, and here it says bodice, front. It has multiple sizing on it, and bodice back. So I'm going to iron these because I can't lay these down flat on a piece of fabric. So let's go to the iron. When you're doing this, make sure that you're delicate and that your iron is very, very dry. I was going to ask Pam, do you ever like transfer the pattern to like a thicker piece of paper? like one that you're gonna use? Cause I can imagine after so many times. That is an excellent question. And before we do this, I'm gonna take you to a place where we actually do that. We have set patterns. Oh, I've like blocked myself in here. Okay, just a second. Okay, going by the trim. So up on the wall, you'll see that there are patterns here. These are called body blocks. And so we have, just a second while I do something unsafe. Okay, I have to get the ladder. Hold on a minute. I shouldn't, I should know better than to try and do something that unsafe. Okay, so now I'm getting on the ladder much better. So this is exactly what you're talking about, uh, Cara. This is a tag board. You can see how thick it is. And this is a bodice front, size 10, with, with two, let me get up a little higher here, with two darts so that I can swing these darts closed and open. And that's the front the back and a fitted sleeve and a wide variety. 
let's take this to the other side so that we can take a look at it more easily. Because this is a great way to lay out a pattern. So yes, in fact, there are several things that we do uh, differently in a costume shop than we would. For making one, we might use a paper pattern or draft a pattern. I'm gonna show you a slight a bit about that. Or, and then we work with body blocks. So let me just iron this first as you would be doing at home and show you that here's my tissue. It's actually more durable than you think, but you, wetness is really a, an uh, enemy of tissue paper. So you wanna make sure that you're really not using steam. And I'm gonna iron it very carefully. So with this pattern, now you can see the nice flat pattern. I'm going to lay it down here. Compared to the one that is not flat. And you're going to get a much more accurate cut with that. Even if you flatten this out with your hand and you, you have to be much more careful and it's never going to be as flat. Right. A couple other things about this pattern is this is multiple sizing. So I have different cutting lines here for each size. And this says line uh, size 10, cut here, size 4, 12, cut here, size 14, and the 16 is the one that has been cut. So that's why um, really pressing it out. That's again a thing not to neglect is preparing the pattern so that you can actually measure it. And so we wouldn't actually cut that pattern down to a 10, right? Because we don't want to ruin the other sizes. No, what we would do is we would do a three thing. Okay. Yeah. And if this, is a, if this was a bodice that we were going to make multiple, we would transfer all the patterns into heavier paper and then we actually do it without a seam allowance so that we can then trace around it. Oh, nice. Yeah. And we do that by paper. So let me just, I can show you. Well, we have pattern paper, but we also use just plain brown paper that is uh, like butcher paper. So. One of the things that we'll look at is sizing and how you measure for this. And you can see this is very heavy. I'm gonna stick this aside for a minute. So if I'm going to measure my bodice, I'm gonna measure across the bodice front and back. Here's center back, here is center front. Here are the the numbers that correspond to each other, six and six. So I can lay these together. And you can see that in the front, this whoever cut this out cut the front to a size 12, but cut the back to a 16. So, you know, it's a little difficult to tell what's going on. I'm going to just measure the size 12 because I have it on both sides. So this is where my bust is. And there's the arm's eye, the shoulder, back neck, <laughs> front neck. When we talked about our measurements, we talked about how far down the bust point is. That's what this measurement is all about. So at nine is gonna be the fullest part of the bust. And let's measure across. This is on a fold in the center front. So I can measure from here to here. If this is my cutting line and I have 5 8 inch seam allowance, I have to reduce that amount. So I can do a math problem. Let me get my paper so I'm not doing it in my head. Okay, my center front is 8 and 5 eighths. So 
center front to side is eight inches. Now, I'm gonna have both the left and right. So that gives me 16 inches across the front. Across the back, I have nine and five eighths. So that gives me 18, nine times two across the back. So 16 plus 18 is 34. And that is because I'm doing that the size 12. Let me see what it says on my pattern. This is also a pattern that requires stretch. So they even give you a stretch indicator on here. Four inches of crosswise fold knit must stretch from here to here. So you need to have at least this much. Every four inches has to have an additional inch of stretch in it. So this is going to be cut to the body shape and then we'll have stretched go around it like a t-shirt. And bust wise, the size 12 is a 34. So we measured exactly 34. They're counting on the stretch of the knit to give you the ease, okay? Ease is the amount of garment that you need to create a um, movement, to create movement. So I'm wearing a knit right now. And this is pretty much to the body, not a lot of sagging around here, but you can see that I can stretch it out and in so it gives the comfort of wearing compared to a non-woven, I mean, compared to a woven, which is not a knit and does not have stretch. You need to allow ease so that you have movement and you have ways to breathe, okay? A couple other things about this pattern that we talked about already. Five eighths inch seams are allowed unless noted. Here is a really good indicator. Lengthen or shorten here. And then here's the natural waistline. So if your waist is down here, you're going to cut this and spread that apart. If your waist is up higher, you're going to fold. I'm going to show you how to fold. Just fold right along the line. And let's say it's one inch higher, you would make a half inch fold. So you can make a half inch fold and you can just pin that in place and then you have to retrace your lines. And that way you're not cutting that for someone else. If it's just you, I mean, we always had to make it for multiple girls, right? You can cut it and they've given you a way to shorten it one inch by just cutting this and moving it up this much or lengthening that much. So I'll just fold and put this in place. And then I would need to redraw my curved line on the side. So that's quite stable. I have my pins in and you can see that I would just need to slightly redraw this cutting line. Okay, so that's how you shorten. That's how you shorten the waist. And if it's, if you need more room from the, sorry, I have an announcement. Okay. If you need more room from the shoulder to the bust, you can decide whether you need it up here based on our measurements, or do you need it, where do you actually need to add the room, okay? And you can even, this is an old trick, you can even put the paper pattern together and lay it on the body and get a general feel for it as well. Always a good technique. My mom did that. Actually, a lot of people do that. 
And then we usually cut it out of a fabric. If we're making something that is that we've never made before and we're trying to figure out the style lines, we'll make it out of a piece of fabric that is similar to what we want to use the garment. Or we use muslin, our washed muslin, so that we have something that will um, work and resemble the garment. So I want to show you the, the other piece that I had gotten out and give you some pointers on this. So this is a body block and you can see that we have them, they're held in place by a pin. This is the size 10, this is the size 12. And we'll work with back and front, just like we have there. Here's the front and here's the back. Now, when you're making a shaped piece like this one, you'll have a dart which will allow fullness. And when that is stitched together, it will equal this exact size. But to cut it, you have to have this additional allowance of fabric to create fullness for the bust. So this piece would fold together like this, and you can see that it creates a bust shape. Okay, actually, yeah, that, there it is. So you have to carefully negotiate how that works. This is also creates bust shape and then a fitted waist detail. And this, the back also has a fitted waist detail by creating that dart. These are called darts when you remove fabric. And that gives you this slight little bit of shape for the shoulder blade. So you can see these are, these are really well used. And then with a fitted sleeve, which has a elbow darts in it to give you shape. So if I pin this together, so that you can actually bend the elbow. It has a shape there. Okay, so this is a very fitted garment. And now let's lay it out. The lengthwise grain goes along the body. Here's my center front, my neck edge, my shoulder, my arm's eye. And this one had a dart here, okay. which is gonna create a little bump on that side. And the lengthwise grain is along the center front. So this will be parallel to my salvage. Okay, this is the arrow always indicates lengthwise grain. So let's lay it out. And we'll talk about some fabric layout too. Again, using one of our donations, we look for the salvage, which is the finished edge, and the crosswise grain, which is the raw edge. So I, if I put my salvage to salvage, I will lay this out with my lengthwise grain going this way 
Let's look at our table. So I have my salvage together. And if you don't have a, um, a table you can pin into, you can use a cardboard cutting cloth, to, cutting board to put onto a other table, or you can just pin them together this way so that you have your salvages together. And then you decide whether or not you want to have your right side or your wrong side out. I think you guys can hardly tell this. This is my wrong side. Let's put wrong side out. If you're going to use a fabric like this that has sizing, you'll want to wash it and dry it first because if your garment is going to be washed and dried, you'll want to do that to your fabric before you use it. So this is a great tidbit. It was stuck to the fabric. It says, Newberries, which is a fabric store, 87 cents a yard. So that's a piece of uh, authentic goods. My guess is it's, it's 60s. Okay. So I'm placing this with my lengthwise grains together. I'm gonna to make sure that my salvage is absolutely perfectly even. Remember, 10% of the time's at the machine. Don't, don't uh, rush this part of getting your salvage even. This is the part that's gonna go up and down on the body. And that's the part that you really don't want something going cockeyed. Okay, I'm just gonna do this first yard. Remember a yard is 36 inches because I know that I don't need more than that for my bodice. So here's a yard to right here. And then I'm going to flatten out my other side. As you pull things, things move around. So you wanna make sure you're pulling against it. So you want it to be absolutely flat. And then once you've changed your flatness, then you can get your fabric, your pattern piece and put it down. In this case, both of these are required to be on the fold. So I have only one fold over here, which means I'm going to have to fold my fabric a different way. I'll have to create two folds. And knowing that this is my lengthwise grain and it's gonna be parallel to my salvage. So what I'll do is I'll fold my two salvages to the center to create two folds. And in my pattern, it would probably tell me that in my cutting instructions. I have to say that that's 
genius because I would just buy an extra yard <laughs> and this is no really, longer. Yeah. Typical, huh? Yeah, that's amazing. So if you do this, you end up with two folds in the same. I tested it to make sure that they would both rest side by side and then they do so that I know this will work, you know? Even still, you can do it so that it will work. Okay, so here's my one. And then I've decided, well, I'm, I'm trying to look at the pattern. Do, the, do I want the butterflies going up or down, but they actually go both ways, so it doesn't matter. So now I can put my fabric right on the fold line. If I needed to add in the bust, I could move this over slightly if my measurement bust point to bust point is wider. And I can also add here on the side seam. So there's several places that I could make this pattern larger very easily. In addition to lengthening or shortening the pattern, I can make it a wider front and then I can add width at the side edge. So I'm just going to pin this down, making sure that if I had a um, if I was not working on the fold and I didn't have my selvages parallel, I would be measuring to my fold line to make sure that I'm absolutely on the straight of grain. So then I'm going to stabilize this. On my fold. Allowing enough pins so that you can cut around it, but also not so many that you are going to cut it with your scissors, right? And I'm using, I actually am just putting the point of my pin out to the outside, and I'll show you this up close. I'm putting the point to the outside and the head of the pin in so that my scissor isn't going to go over that. Now, if I have to mark something on this, let's say I wanted to add onto my garment right here, I'm going to add a half an inch. So remember that if I have a 5 8 inch seam allowance already, I'm going to add on to that. And you can do that with a pencil. And we often use, I even just use a graphite pencil. So you can do this and I can just add on from my, I'm adding on from my cutting line. To make this just a little bit bigger. And then you can use, you can just eyeball that if you don't have a French curve, or if you have a French curve, it's even better because you can just trace along it. And remember, they come in a wide variety of shapes. So you just find one that is the shape that you need. And that creates a little bit uh, more room for me on here. You want to also transfer over your notch. So see how this is lower, higher, and this would be higher. They've cut it in, but when you cut it, you can cut around the notch and you cut it out. Another way to mark is to mark with tracing wheel and paper. So I could do the same thing by putting my tracing paper under here easier said than done, Pam. So I could put my tracing paper under my pattern and do the same thing.
and using my pattern isn't moving, so that's fine. Doing my 5 eighths of an inch and use the tracing wheel to transfer this red paper marking. So my red marking is along here. I'm going to actually show you what it looks like on a piece of muslin. So if I was going to mark with my tracing wheel and paper, I get this fabulous dotted line. And you may recognize that line because that was on your understitching pattern piece. Everyone got that on their understitching. Remember this piece? It was your stitching line was indicated inside with that. Okay, so now that I've marked everything, I, I don't need to mark this higher piece right here because I can just cut around it and I'm going to cut. I would pin both of my pieces down. At the same time so that I am not wasting time by cutting one piece and then another. You can, sometimes you have to move your pieces to, for the most efficient use, but. This could have been made by somebody that has somewhat of a flatter bust and that's why they have more of a back on here than the. So now I'm going to cut my two pieces. And I'm going to cut around my notch. I'm going to note how these notches work. And I'm going to talk you through them right now because you won't be able to see them. Here's notch one on the shoulder. So I would stitch this seam first. I don't see notch two. Oh, that's a skirt thing. Then on the bodice, I have four, which is my facing. I have six, which is my, I have four, five, which is my front neck facing, neck facing, and then I'm gonna do my side seams. So you can actually follow along with the numbers. Let's go ahead and cut. We wanna cut directionally. You want to try and keep your fabric on the table to cut. So here's my, I have a notch and I'm going to cut around my notch. There are a couple of other ways to do it, but there's nothing wrong with cutting around the notch. And I'm having my, resting my hand here to disturb my fabric least so that I really keep this going. I'm going to go ahead and cut the bottom. Cutting my notch. That's where it's going to add up to the skirt. And I have enlarged this. And I'm going to go ahead and cut across to my other piece. Because then I can get rid of all this extra fabric. And now I'm just dealing with this piece and I'm going to cut it into, I'll cut it towards you so you can see. Cutting along my extra five eighths of an inch that I added back to the front, which is already on my back piece. My notch. And then I'm going to cut my arm side. So you cut around that, keeping your fabric on the table and your pattern piece flat. Okay, so now I have this piece cut on the fold. 
it will be open up and be one piece double that size. And now I have this piece, just double checking it. Looks good. Let me move this one out of the way. I'll cut across the top edge. Notch. I'll cut that. I'm going to cut that a different way so that you can see it. I realize I don't want a mask, so I'll cut the side. Now, I don't cut the line. You don't want to cut the line off, okay? Because then you're making your garment a sixteenth of an inch smaller. You want to cut to the bottom line. And then I'll cut my neck edge. And this has a double notch, so I'm going to cut that as one giant notch, and then we'll take a look at this. And then I'll cut my arm side. Pam, are you going to wear this after you make it? No. <laughs> this is so not me. I can't I even imagine. I don't think it's a lot of people. This is a donation piece. You know, we, we use a lot of different things, so we cut up a lot of donation pieces. So let's pin it together on a mannequin. What do you think? Let me get the tan over here. Who's easy? Yeah. So I want to point out to you <laughs> that this said bus 34 for size 12. And here's our mannequin size six, bus 33 and three quarters. So this is gonna be a size six garment. And remember it was a 16, 34 was a 16, was a 12 and now it's a six. <laughs> wow. I'm sure we can't figure out what's going on, right? But it's worth it to take a look at this. And now I've transferred my markings. I know my, I don't, I can always refer to my pattern piece for my numbers. So I don't need to worry about that. I'm gonna unpin. And we're just gonna put this on. And the great thing is you can just remove that pattern piece. And we can put it right onto the mannequin. So let's. Just pin it in place here for a sec. Where's my center front? Well, that's not my center front. There's my center front. Okay, because these two split front. So we're just going to pin these together on this mannequin. And we'll see how it looks. And then I'm going to do, I'll set up, we'll take a break and I'll set up and show you a quick draping technique by just working with a mannequin only. And it's that is really fun, really fun to work with a mannequin. It's funny you say, am I going to wear this? Because I was thinking, oh, my goodness, look, I'm wearing this bright striped thing. Like, you know, I, I really am sort of solids. <laughs> OK, so the, again, both this front and back are on fold. So there's my back. And I'm going to pin this together as we would there's my two notches. You can see right here that I'm going to pin together at my five eighths of an inch, just as a, this is when they said you can pin based. This is pin basting when I'm pinning it on my seam line. Let me see if I can get this up a little higher so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, 
So there's my pin basting. Here's my other side I will also pin baste. Matching the notch. And again, I'm not going to sew it this way with the pins going the same way as the stitching, but I can try it on my mannequin this way and get a good idea. I could have just basted it together also. And then I'll pin my side seams and match my notch here. And then I'll do one at the waist and one at the bottom. And this has a curved hip, high hip line where the skirt would be attached. Now you remember that I was supposed to be using some stretch for this, which I didn't actually use. So we'll see. I just wanted to show you the pattern layout idea. Now we're gonna get stretch around the arm's eye anyway, because that's a slight bias. The neck edge is gonna be a slight bias. So let's get this pinned up. Okay, now we'll take a look at this. I'm just trying to see where the bust goes. If I wanted to make this, a, um, okay, that's gonna lie flat. See, I can see how that will lie flat. That will work. This is where if you wanted to make a fitted garment of this with your, you could create a dart here and just watch how this changes the attitude of the garment. And I'll do one on the other side. That's why working with mannequins is so much fun. And then you could just do the same on the other side to create the dart. And note the arm's eye is still going to be a fine shape. Actually, my, my friend's daughter is about this size, so should be, she's thrilled for this kind of stuff. Okay, so. I have a pretty cool, just a shaped bodice. My back neck is fine and it, it's just not completely fitted. I mean, it's just a basic shape. So really we could just do a bias binding around here, do a uh, what we did with our understitching around the arm's eye and do a shirt tail hem. If I do fold and fold and you'd have a simple top. Fast, huh? So that gives us a great way to work with a pattern. Any questions? Cara, you've been asking, which is really great all along. But it's nice okay. to be able to just test on a mannequin and see. Now with this garment, because it's not a stretch, how do you get in and out of it? Because they're relying on the stretch to pull this out. See, I can't get this garment off. Mm. We, of course, have collapsible mannequins, right? Where they, they, oops. Huh, she doesn't collapse anymore. Okay, so these, these uh, shoulders collapse in usually. But what can I do if I want to make, keep this fabric and I want to make this? I can put a separating zipper in under the arm. 
And generally our closures go along the left side. So I could mark this with my pencil. I'm going to mark my, my, I'm going to mark my pins, both sides by simply marking along my pin line. Okay. And I'll mark my other side. So once I'm sure that I have my marks in and I can see them, I can go ahead and take my pins off. And now I have put in a place where I can do a separating zipper right here, or I can even put in a zipper upside down so that it opens here. And then I can take it off this way. Very common with period garments. Then I would lay this flat 